welcome you to worship this morning. We do have a few announcements. Uh, we will have kids group tonight at 5 o'clock. Uh, the session will meet Tuesday at 6.30 here in the Fellowship Hall. Um, Wednesday night Bible study will be this week at 6.30. Our word for this week is regeneration. Um, as I have mentioned before, uh, the Methodist Church around the corner, they are collecting boxes. Um, to, to help those have a meal at Easter time. And so if you were interested in helping with that, um, there is a list downstairs in the bulletin board of items you can provide to make a box or uh, you can write a check about $25 and myself or one of the other church members uh, can go and make that box to get to them by the 24th. So if you're interested in that, please uh, either buy the items or if you need me to buy the items, let me know. <laughs> um, and so... That is all the announcements I can think of uh, this morning. Again, it's good to be in the house of the Lord together with you. But as we have come to worship, may we now hear our God's call to worship from Psalm number 81, verse 1. Hear now God's word. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Let's pray. Indeed, our God, you are a God of strength, perfect, holy, unmovable, a God that we can find hope in, that we can find joy in, for you are the Almighty. Lord, today we come to give you our praise. And Lord, as we are fallen our worship, it's not perfect, it's not pure, but Lord, may you receive it here today through Lord Jesus Christ, who has taken us as sinners and brought us into your kingdom, Lord, that in you we might find the strength to endure this wicked world, the joy that we can have in you as our God and as our Savior, and Lord, I pray that today you would open our hearts and minds Draw us near to your throne of grace. And Lord, above all, may your holy name be praised. We pray all of this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Our first scripture lesson comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Hear now God's word. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Let's again look to our God. Heavenly Father, again, what a joy it is to be able to speak to you today. Lord, to be able to come before you with all of our, our needs, with all of our desires, with all of our, our thanksgiving and our joy. Lord, it is indeed a wonderful thing to gather in your presence today. Lord, as we gather here, we are reminded that we have not earned this privilege ourselves. No, Lord, for our sin, we have fallen far from you. We come in filthy rags with nothing to offer. We have become because we don't look at ourselves, but we look to Christ as the one who has made us to be able to stand in your sight. For the Lord Jesus, he is the one who has come and cleansed us from our dirty sin. Who has given us robes of righteousness bought by his blood to replace the filthy rags that we have. Lord, today we come before you confessing that we are sinners in your sight. Confessing our need for Christ. And confessing the joy that we have because of your grace. Lord, we come to you today to know that although we have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus, we still struggle. In the middle of life's temptations and hardships, uh, we often falter in our faith. We may doubt. 
we may give in to our sin and follow through with the pleasures we enjoy. We might not do as you have called us to do. And Lord, we come today and we search our hearts, seeing how we have failed you, how we've broken your commandments, and we come and we repent of them. And Lord, pray that you would help us to overcome these sins from here on out. Lord, help us to do as you tell us in the Lord's Prayer. To go and to, to seek your will. That we would seek your kingdom would come into this world. That we would be instruments of your grace. Seeing how we can share the gospel and minister to this world for you. Or that we would seek your will in our life, not simply what we want, but Lord, looking to you to honor you, to glorify you. But Lord, it's not a burden to do this, it's a joy. But we get to serve the Almighty God who has loved us enough to die for us. And so, Lord, may our hope each and every day be to honor you and to live for you in all that we do. Lord, we come again today and we pray that you would be with our church. Help us to continue to grow spiritually, numerically, that all we would do would be for your kingdom and for your glory. Help all of us here who are struggling with different things. Lord, give us the comfort, give us the hope that we need. Lord, help those in this world that are dealing with this pandemic. Lord, heal them. Help them to overcome this. Lord, help those that are dealing with depression, anxiety, broken people in their lives. Lord, may you be their hope, no matter how hopeless the day may seem. But Lord, we know we can come to you in all things. And now, Lord, we come to you in a moment of silent prayer, giving to you that which is on our heart. Now, Lord, we come to you, and we don't know what to pray. Pray the prayer that you taught your disciples pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Turn with me in your Bibles. Our scripture passage today comes from the book of John, 
chapter 7, verse 53, through chapter 8, verse 11. Now, as we come to these verses here today, uh, we need to do something different than what we normally do every Sunday. I want you to put on your academic glasses with me for a moment. And the reason for that is these verses here in John have been debated much over the years. Now, if you notice, depending on your Bible translation, you can see this or not. Some translations handle it. They look like any other verse in the Bible. Some omit it completely. Some take it and put it as a footnote. Or if you have an ESV Bible like mine, it is put in brackets. And the reason for that is that this particular story is not found in the earliest manuscripts of the Bible. Um, as we can understand, the earlier the manuscript, closer to Jesus' time, the more reliable it is. And we can understand more and more exactly what God's word was. But this particular story does not pop up until about the 5th century. And so it seems to be have, added, have been added later. Now we can probably understand this is a story that indeed did happen, but it was not part of John's original gospel. And because of that, uh, therefore not inspired by God. So what do we do? Well, if you disagree with me and say it is, that's great. But I wrestled with that this week, but I was reminded of the words of a seminary professor. He said, in these verses, we aren't taught anything contrary to what the rest of the Bible teaches. The themes here are indeed biblical. This is a passage that has sound doctrine on display. It doesn't say anything crazy. But we can see what Scripture teaches right here. And I think because of that, that's, I feel led to go through it with you here this morning. And so before we see what it is said there, let us go to our God for help. Everlasting God, we come before you again today. Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your truth. Lord, as we come to this passage uh, that has been disputed over the years, Lord, may you still shine through our hearts, showing us your truth here in these words. Lord, help us to glean from you today, to love you more, and to live for you always. We pray this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Again, John chapter 7, verse 53, through chapter 8, verse 11. Hear now the word of the Lord. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. The word of the Lord. The truth of the Lord. Amen. He made free use of Christian vocabulary. He talked about the blessing of the Almighty and the Christian confessions, which would be the pillars of the new government. He assumed the earnestness of a man weighed down by historic responsibility. He handed out pious stories to the press, especially to the church papers. He showed his tattered Bible and declared that he drew the strength for his great work from it. As scores of Christian people welcomed him as a man sent from God. Indeed, Adolf Hitler was a master of outward religiosity with no inward reality. This quote from today in the word devotional gives us a great example of what hypocrisy looks like. We all know Hitler, and we know that he did not practice what he preached. 
Instead, he was responsible for one of the gravest atrocities this world has ever seen. Now, there may be other people that you, in history that you have learned about that you can say, well, they're, they're great hypocrites. But I, don't, I think we don't have to go very far in our own lives to know what a hypocrite looks like, right? If you think about the people you've interacted with over the years who say one thing and do another, who use God's word in a selfish manner that only fits themselves, it's not very hard to find hypocrites all around us. This morning, I don't want to talk about the people we know. I want to talk about us. Does hypocrisy find itself out coming out in your life? How do you measure up? If your, your name was given and inserted where Adolf Hitler's was, would it be true? Would your name, would you be a master of our religiosity? With no end of reality. As we do some soul searching for a second, I do think, though, that the church has a hypocrisy problem. Ask any non believer, they'll tell you. The church is full of hypocrites. But it's true. We say, because we know our Bibles, that we go to worship, that we're fine. But yet our lives do not show our faith at all. Now, and there might even be times when your life does show forth what the Christian faith teaches. But in our hearts, it's not about God anymore. Sometimes our pride sets in and that hypocrisy, just like the, the Jewish leaders in this passage we were, we were talking about. We start to develop a holier-than-thou attitude. Look at me. Look what I can do. And no longer do we serve God for the sake of his truth. We start to look at others as sinful. And unworthy. Hypocritical attitude, hypocritical attitude may come even in subtle ways, set subtle ways. But yet, in our passage this morning, reveals to us the nature of hypocrisy and why that is so dangerous for us. Because although we might think that we are high and mighty, the truth is that we are sinners. We have our own weaknesses. We have our own shortcomings. And although we might say that we're believers, just like Hitler does, we have to ensure that our life shows the fact that we are. And our passage this morning gives us a glimpse at what hypocrisy looks like. As we see the scribes and the Pharisees coming before Jesus. But also... Not only it shows us how we are not to be, but also it gives us a wonderful example of the grace of God here as Jesus shows mercy as well. And so as we look at these verses here, I think the main thing that we will see this morning is how we can turn from a life of hypocrisy to a life of sincerity. How Jesus calls us to turn from that life of hypocrisy. To a life of authenticity. Now as, as we begin here looking at these verses. We see what hypocrisy looks like in action. Again we can say that this account is probably inserted here. And so it's probably not during the setting of the Feast of Booze like we've been talking about. But we do know that what's going on is at the temple. And at the temple uh, many have gathered to hear Jesus teach. But it was a large place that Jesus' enemies could easily intermingle into those numbers. As they come in, look at what they do here in verses 3 through 5 with me. They bring this woman who has been caught in adultery and they say, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This woman had been caught sleeping with a man. Now, we don't know exactly if she is married or, or not, um, but it's a sin. And this particular sin, if you go back to the Old Testament, the penalty for such a crime was to be stoned to death. And so the Pharisees bring her before Jesus and remind him of that here. And they ask him, well, Jesus, what should we do? 
Now, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to know that these men are not being sincere with this. They truly don't want Jesus to show them how they need to proceed. But as verse 6 tells us, they did all this to test Jesus in order to try to bring charges against him. This whole situation would put Jesus between a rock and a hard place. For if Jesus said, don't stone him, then they could have easily said, well, Jesus is not upholding the law. And so he would have lost credibility. On the other side of it, if Jesus did say, yes, stone her, well, one, he was known for his compassion, so he would have lost followers in that way, as well as making Rome mad. Because Rome, they occupied Jerusalem at that time, and they were the ones that said who would live and who would die. So if Jesus said this woman was to die, then Rome would have a problem with him. So what is Jesus to do? The scribes and the Pharisees, they think, now we've got him. But it's so sad to see them doing this. Here you have these men who are trained in the word of God to uphold it, to teach it. Not doing that, but instead using it for their own vindictive means. They have new, no true care for if justice is to be done. Only selfishly using the law for their purposes in ways that it was never intended. It's like a marker. We've all used markers, right? Markers are intended to be used on paper, to draw and to color, right? But what happens when you give a two-year-old a marker and walk out of the room? They use that marker in ways that it's not intended to be used, right? Instead of a pretty little doodle you can hang on your refrigerator, you now have a giant wall mural that you now have to pay to fix. When you use the wrong way, damage is done. But on an even grander scale, think about the Word of God. When it is used for hypocritical, selfish means, it can cause so much more damage. See, God gives us the Bible to reveal Himself to us. And so he calls us to faith and to repentance in Jesus. It's called the sword of the Spirit for a reason. It cuts through the lies of the devil. But yet when we stop using that sword to proclaim God's grace and salvation, and instead use it to destroy people or to build ourselves up according to our own agenda, well, that sword can cause some pretty deep cuts. Now, let me be clear here. We do use the Bible to call people out of their sins for their own good, out of love, to try to lead them to Jesus. So what I'm saying here is not to ignore people's sins and just put your head down this week from under the rug. But what I am saying here is that we shouldn't use God's word like the Pharisees do. They use it to try to discredit Jesus for their own gain. I think there's a temptation to do the same to others in our own life. When we see people who have, who have failed morally, we continue to drive them into the ground because of those failings instead of trying to help them back. If you turn on any TV now, you see it. Look at all the scandals that are happening. But in all of that, is anyone trying to help restore these people? No. They want to diminish them. They want to humiliate them, punish them. But, but that is not the way, as Paul says, that we were taught Christ. We should not be using God's word for our own gain, to, to make us look better, to puff ourselves up, to get a position. But we're to use it to, to call each other out. Not call each other out for our sins, but to call each other out of our sins. Seeking to build one another up for the sake of Christ. And even in our own lives, if we're not seeking to diminish people, Hypocrisy still might set in to try to build yourself up. Hey, look at me. Look what I can do. We no longer care about pointing to Jesus, but to point to ourselves. We have to see here that a genuine believer 
is someone that cares for others. It's not caring about what it makes me look like, how it puffs me. We're ones that want to use God's word in the way it's intended to be used. Let's point others to Christ. And hypocrites aren't ones that do that. So we must not follow the Pharisees' example. Because here's the thing. Jesus knows our hearts. And our second point today is that our hypocrisy will be exposed in one way or another. People may not see your true intent. They may see you as the, the Christian of all Christians. One who goes to church, who, who lives out their faith, but yet in our heart we do it for ourselves. Others don't see that. But God does. The same thing is true here. As these men say, what should we do, Jesus? Jesus at first says nothing, and he begins to draw on the ground. Now, many have speculated what Jesus has written on the ground, but the truth is, here in the passage, we don't know. But honestly, I think that Jesus is just kind of doodling to make this, the Pharisees and the scribes stew for a little bit. But they continue to ask him, and Jesus finally speaks up in verse 7, and he says here, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he goes to right on the ground again. Now, we have probably all heard that phrase before, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, right? But I do think we need some context here why Jesus says that. See, Jesus, he's talking about not sin in general, but the same sin of adultery. And what he's doing is he's actually calling back to the Old Testament again. You see, these Pharisees, they brought this woman before Jesus, and they said that they were witnesses to this crime. And the truth is, is that witnesses to such crimes would be the first to cast the stone, to throw that first stone. But if those witnesses were complicit in that crime, then they too would be just as guilty. Because if you think about this circumstance, where is the man in all of this? It takes two for this type of sin. Well, they probably let him go. They had chosen to cover up this man's sin while bringing this woman under the penalty of the law. Thinking, well, Jesus has compassion on women. We just need her. In doing so, they were made accessories to this crime and therefore were guilty. And they knew that. That's why you see them slowly but surely filtering out in verse 9. What Jesus is doing here is he's essentially call, saying the pot's calling the kettle black. You're calling out this person for her sin, but yet you are just as guilty. They might have not said that, but Jesus knew what was in their hearts. And he knows ours too. He knows if in our life, if we are being sincere, or hypocritical. Just because others don't see it doesn't mean that he doesn't know. And just because someone's sin may be different from yours doesn't put you on a pedestal. Because we're not innocent either. I want you to think about dirt for a second. There are different types of dirt. There's clay, there's sand, there's peat, there's silt. And you can have different bags of them. But let's say I go get into the clay and you go get into the silt. We might got into different types, but no matter which one in the end, we're both still dirty. And the same is true with sin. Somebody else may struggle with the sin that you don't. But that doesn't mean that we aren't dirty either. Think about adultery. Let's mention this passage for a second. Adultery is anything outside of marriage between one man and one woman. And I think there's one type of adultery in this day and age that we fixate upon. Homosexuality. We are so against it. Yes, it is a sin. I will say that. It is a sin. But we turn a blind eye to those that are living together that aren't married. To those that are having affairs, to lust, pornography. And we tend to not put them all on the same plane. 
But the truth is that all of these things are sin. They all fall under the category of adultery. All of these make one guilty. And if we are willing to ignore some rather than others, that we are just as guilty as the Pharisees are here. But this doesn't happen with just adultery. Think about lying. You might berate somebody for, for a big lie that, that affected a lot of people. But we often don't talk about the small white lies, right? They're okay. Or, sure, you might not condone somebody going out and stealing the neighbor's car. Are you okay with lying on your taxes? You might not have made an idol out of drinking, but you may have made an idol out of your job, out of your possessions, even out of yourself. We have to understand here that we are all guilty. As we saw in that first scripture lesson, people like to quote it saying, judge not lest you be judged, but it doesn't mean that we don't point out sin out of love. What that passage is trying to tell us is that we need to stop judging others with selfish intent and turn and see our own sin, see the logs in our eyes before we try to take the splinter out of theirs. God knows our hearts, and because of that, we stand guilty before him because of it. As much as we may condemn others for, for their sin, if we're honest, we too stand condemned for our own. As the Jewish leaders here are able to cast a single stone, we're tempted to look down upon others for their failings. We must remember that we can't cast that stone either. Because just like them, we're sinners. Just like them, we are in need of God's mercy and grace. But I want you then to see the beauty of this passage here. Yes, Talking about hypocrisy and saying we don't need to do that. But knowing that we all do, what do we do? Well, we find joy in Jesus. Because here in our final point, we see that there is grace to be found when we replace our hypocrisy with authenticity. This woman, she is guilty and she knows it. Yet look what Jesus says to her in verses 10 and 11. He says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no After Jesus' remark, well, all the accusers, they're gone. And so Jesus asks, it says, you know, woman, where are your accusers? Now, this word for woman, it's actually a, a respectful term. Um, so, you know, where, where do they go? Well, there, there, there's no one here. Well, with these accusers gone, there is no case. There's no witnesses to condemn her. And so, notice what Jesus says. Neither do I condemn you. Now, I do have to say, Jesus is not condoning adultery here. He knows that she has sinned, as we see in the end of verse 11, where he says, go and sin no more. But what he's saying here is, well, there's no longer a case. So he refuses to condemn her. What a wonderful thing. But I think there's something deeper behind it. And I want to draw our attention back to John 3.17 to do that. Now, we all know John 3.16, right? We can quote it in our sleep. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever would believe in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. But the next verse in John 3.17 is just as powerful. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved. He has not come strictly to condemn and punish. And I'm thankful for that because we just talked about it. we're all guilty. We're all sin. We all, we all fall short. But because of Christ, he has come to save those who will turn to him in faith. As their only hope is the Lord and Savior. That's a hope that this woman that's guilty of adultery can have. That is a hope that a person struggling with addiction this is the hope that someone who has made terrible mistakes that the world has not let them live down can find it by turning to this Savior and receiving forgiveness and grace. 
when we stop looking at ourselves and saying how good I am and seeing ourselves better than others, but in turn sincerely see ourselves as sinners who need grace just as much as that person in the jail said, just as that person that's in the courtroom. When we see ourselves as sinners like that, we find that remedy that we need too. You see, and that, that's why the gospel gives us so much hope. Because we see how bad our sin is. Yet we see how much greater our God's grace is because he has covered our sin by his blood. You see, this woman didn't walk away forgiven because God just gives out freebies. But because his justice, that punishment that our sin deserves, will be paid for on the cross. And from that sacrifice, we have been given mercy beyond mercy. And if we think, think about that for a second, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? It gives us joy. It gives us hope. Because we have been forgiven by Jesus. But there's something else here than just that joy that we need to see. Look at the end of verse 11. Jesus says, go, and from now on, sin no more. And this shows us, oh, what a wonderful thing forgiveness is. But what it also means is from now on we must forsake our sin. And I think we often miss that part, don't we? Yet Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 that if we have come to sincere, authentic faith in Jesus, that we are to put off our old self, which belongs to our former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And be renewed in the spirit of our minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. If we have come to know Jesus and the forgiveness that he brings, then our proper response is to no longer live in our hypocrisy, but to seek authentic purity in the future. If we call ourselves believers, there must be a shift in our life. We no longer look at our sin and want our sin like we once did. That doesn't mean we're not, we're not going to struggle with that. But instead, we, we, we do need to, to have a new outlook on life. One of love and praise for Jesus. Seeking to show that love by going and sinning no more. You see, that's what separates the hypocrites from the sincere believers. Having a life that is lived to the glory of God. Not to earn his favor. Or to puff ourselves up living for his glory as the one who has forgiven us and saved us. As broken as sinful as we might be. Now we don't know if this woman continued on in her sin. But we, what we can know is that if we sincerely follow Jesus, we will slip up. I'll tell you that. We're all going to sin this week. But as we're focusing on Christ and trying to turn from that sin, even if we do fall short, we can still find the hope that he has truly saved us and forgiven us. And so in seeing that, in seeing the mercy and grace of Christ, seeing what hypocrisy and what authenticity look like, as we close this morning, my question for each of you is, where do you fall? Which category do you find yourself in? Are you like the Pharisees, living hypocritically? Seeking your own gain and pride in this life or using God's word uh, for your own agenda. Being like whitewashed tombs, as Jesus says. Well kept neat on the outside, but full of dead bones on the inside. Or have you humbled yourself before God? Have you seen your sin for what it is and turned to him sincerely and wholeheartedly? So that what is on the inside indeed does match what is on the outside. I can't answer that question for you. I don't know you like that. But you know, and God knows. But I do encourage us all today, after seeing this, to look to Jesus as the hope that fallen people like us need. And then, and only then, once we see our need for Christ, we see our sinful brokenness, and we see his grace and forgiveness, then as we continue to seek to get that log out of our own eye, we can turn to others who too are stuck in their sin and offer them that same hope and that same forgiveness 
that we find in Jesus that we need just as much as they do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we confess that we are sinners. We are not good enough. We are fallen. We break your commandments daily. Lord, we humble ourselves before you today. Lord, show us your mercy and grace in Christ. Show us the forgiveness that we truly need for our sins. Help us to see that no matter how hard we might work, our own is not good enough. And so, Lord, may we find our hope in you. Lord, help us to live sincere Christian lives. Help us to not be hypocrites like the Pharisees and the scribes were. Help us to live wholeheartedly for you. Not diminishing others for our gain. Not living this life just simply to puff up our ego. But doing all that we do sincerely to honor you who have delivered us. Lord, you are our hope. You are our joy. You are all we ever need. And Lord, may our hearts turn from ourselves to you daily. Help us to have a sincere faith always. So that when the world sees us, they wouldn't see just a bunch of hypocrites. But they would see people that have been changed from the inside out by the power of the living God and the Lord Jesus. Lord, that by our witness, they too would come to know what true forgiveness looks like in Christ. Guide us, keep us, bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, if you're uncomfortable with singing, we give you a moment to head out. But our uh, first hymn. First and last verses is number 310, Take My Life and Let It Be.
Receive now the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you.